Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest upon us is Dr. Alexander Lederman from Switzerland. Dr. Lederman is a private docent at the University of Geneva. He's also the CEO of BMED and has been the president of the Swiss Shoulder Society and also the president of the Foundation for Research and Training and Teaching in Orthopedics, the Forum. He's been the chair of the membership committee and member of the central committee of the European Shoulder and Elbow Society and also member of the central committee of the French Arthroscopy Society. Dr. Lederman has been the Congress president for the European Society of Shoulder and Elbow in Geneva in the past. If you've noticed, Dr. Lederman has delivered a couple of lectures on our channel. It's already reached a huge audience and today's my great honor to bring back Dr. Alexander Lederman for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Alex. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Um, everything's okay on your side? All well. All well. In Geneva, we, we have the mask again, unfortunately. <laughs> so things are, it's, this is endless. So today, I would like, if you agree, uh, to talk about the, the Latage procedure. This is uh, a very nice way to stabilize shoulders. Uh, I learned this technique with one of the masters. I will talk about it later on. And the, the more I perform this technique, I mean, the, the, the more I love it. We, we did some um, small change, um, small changes, and uh, I will talk about it later on. Uh, and honestly, the results are amazing. In my hand, quite reliable. And um, I would like to share this experience with you today. So how to perform a latage the right way. I think that the, the key for success is the, there are a lot of technical keys. One of them is patient installation. Uh, you need to control, of course, intraoperative bleeding because this is small incision. So if it begins to bleed, to bleed the vis visualization is not so great. Um, one of the key is the anterior glenoid expo exposure. I use today uh, four retractors to do this. And um, with this retractor, you have a wonderful, wonderful view. But this is really dedicated retractor and you, you need to have them if you want to do a latage properly. Uh, then the position of the graft is really important. It should be flush uh, with the joint line. Actually, I, it can be at the flush with the joint line or maybe even with the cartilage. We still don't know exactly where we need to put the graft because all the previous studies has been done on 2D images that are really a bad representation of a complex 3D problem. So graft has to be flush. It doesn't have to be overhanging because it may lead to arthritis. It if it's too medial, of course, there is not a great stabilization. And uh, you also need to control the position um, anteriorly, and, uh, anteriorly and inferiorly. Um, and of course, one of the aim is graft healing. And I think that the open technique is the best way to obtain this. So installation, uh, this, is the, this is clearly the, the key. Uh, this is what you want to, this is the direction of the screw that you should aim. And most of the, most of the surgeon, unfortunately, they go straight into the shoulder. They do a standard deltopectoral approach. And consequently, the direction of the screw is not so great. So to do properly a latage, you need to have a rather medial incision to have a better access. So if you, if you are too lateral, your screw will be divergent. And this is typically an X-ray that we don't want to see. Uh, the screw have to be parallel because if they are too divergent, and this is something that we published in 2012, they will go straight into the suprascapular nerve. So if you want to avoid this complication, uh, you need to have screws that are parallel. The, the maximum angle should be something like Ten degrees, and of course, your screw don't don't have your screw doesn't have to uh, to be overhanging posteriorly. Otherwise, you may damage the uh, suprascapular nerve. And this is um, an X-ray that I found in a patient, and you see that the screw are going straight into the nerve. 
and then the screw have to be parallel. And this is one of the key to increase the contact surface between the bone blood and the glenoid. On your left, you have my first atroscopic latarge. And if you look carefully, you see that from the joint, it looks absolutely perfect because the graft is at the right position, but then there is no more contact between the graft and the glenoid because the screw are divergent. So if you want to have a good contact, you need to have a gain parallel screw. I think that this is one of the key of this surgery. So make a rather median incision and maybe provide some support to the medial and posterior scapula in order to have the tilt of the scapula that move from 30 degrees, because this is the resting position, to something like zero, zero degrees. To do this, you can put some, a, a pillow between the, the scapula when you prepare the patient, or you can use a retractor, the TRIA retractor. We will talk about it later on. So this is the right way. And this, the, the red is, of course, what you should avoid. And then there are a lot of tip and tricks. Uh, Lionel Neton, one of my friends, developed a very nice, very nice bone block grasper. This is a museu uh, forceps, and he added to this museu forceps a blade that will protect and support the graft. So, yeah. So you grab the, the graft and hold it with this nice um, museu. And this will avoid to go into the skin with the screwdriver and with the, the wires. It's an example. So you hold the graft, put the blade, and then when you flip it, you have a perfect, um, you hold perfectly the, the graft so you can prepare it. You need to do a very nice decortication of the graft. And I just remind you that the, the width of the graft is between 14 to 16 millimeters. So when you will drill your hole in the anterior glenoid, your first hole should be at around seven to eight millimeters from the, uh, from the glenoid. If you are more natural, you will have an inferior overhanging of the graft. Then you can use some guide. Honestly, I'm not using it, but the industry provides some guide to have parallel um, uh, wires, uh, something that could be interesting. Subscapularis. So we, we are, I will have a long video of the, the surgery at the end, but if you want to expose the subscapularis, you need to put your arm in elevation and maximal external rotation, and consequently will you will really have a nice view of the subscap. And I just remind you that this is a muscular split. This is not a tendinous split. So you need to have really a nice, an important external rotation to see the muscle belly. When this is done, you find the upper border of the subscap, the lower border with the three sisters, and your split should be at the two third, one third. So it should be quite inferior. To tell you the truth, from time to time, I am right in the middle. But the, the, the worst case scenario should be to, to be too high because this will limit postoperatively external rotation and avoid tendon um, violation when you do this. This is a muscular split again. And when this is done, you just use a gel peel retractor. It's angulated at 90 degrees and this will expose nicely the anterior capsule. And when the capsule is exposed, you just do a posterior, a posterior push on your arm. So you will know exactly where is the uh, joint line. When this is done, you do a vertical osteotomy. I use mainly three retractors. There is on your left, a standard um, Langenbeck. You can use this one or eight millimeters Langenbeck in order to have more space for, for me. I put a, um, a swab around the end of the lung and back, so my nurse just pull inferiorly and they, they, uh, she does not disturb me. In the middle, you have the tri TRIA retractor designed by Albert TRIA. And this retractor is nice because this is thinner than the standard Fukuda. So you don't need to have a, an important vertical split. And at the end, you have a small hook and this hook helps to rotate 
the scapular from 30 degrees on the thorax to zero degrees in order to have a better um, access of the glenoid for the screw. And finally, on the right side, it's a wide glenoid retractor, and this is one of the key. This glenoid has to be pushed quite far away between the glenoid and the subscapularis, and then I push myself the glenoid on the thorax of my patient, and we, with the other hand, I drill. And consequently, from a really medial position, I succeed to have these parallel screws. So three retractors, the tria, medially, the glenoid retractor laterally, and inferiorly an Orman. That's it. Of course, I still keep the, the gel P to retract the, the subcapillaries. And if you do this, and if you play with your tria and your glenoid retractor, you will see exactly what uh, you want. Then when I, when I position my graft, I use either a forceps or I, love OC, uh, I also love to use a small Dirac to control the rotation of my, my graft. Because as soon as you will screw the graft, the graft rotates. So it's a very nice trick to hold it. Um, at the end, and this is something that you will see in the, in, in the video, I do a labral loin section between the graft and the glenoid. So I do not re remove the labrum like Gilles Valch was doing. I really keep it. And I close the capsule uh, on the uh, coracoacromial ligament stump in external rotation, slight elevation, and I do also a posterior level push. If you look at all the videos that are on the web, the people that reinsert the capsule do it with the human head anteriorly dislocated. And this is an absolute, this is a nonsense. So you really need to reduce the shoulder before. Uh, before tightening your uh, your capsule. And I will talk about it later, but we are just finishing uh, a study that proved that you don't need any sling postoperatively. So this is the video that uh, we, we did. I will maybe remove the song and speak myself. So you do a four to five incision from the tip of the crack rate process. You just go north, find uh, what we call the Moronheim fossa. This is an area where you don't have any vessels or nerve. Find the upper border of the pectoralis and then you just reach quite easily um, the, the clavidel topic fascia. When this is done, you put a hormone on the crack rate process and you um, detach the lateral border of the conjunct tendon, find the C ligament, and you cut the stump, you need to have a, at least 1.5 millimeters of the, of the CA ligament. Then you move back uh, medially in a deduction, cut with a 90 degrees angulated, so your crack rate process, and consequently you can bring this crack rate process to the skin. Then you use the, the forceps. Um, I do a decortication of the onto surface of the crack rate process. And with an open surgery, this is something that you really control nicely. So you need to have a decortication. Ask your nurse to put water on the, um, on the graft so it, you, you do not burn the, the graft. And then um, you put your two wires. The space between the two wires should be something like one centimeter. And then you drill. And with the instrument of uh, Lionel Letton, with the blade that I showed you before, um, you avoid to damage the, the skin. Then in external rotation, you will expose the subscap. I, I take a um, myo ciseau, put it in the muscle belly, and then I just spread. And when I see my capsule, I introduce this Roman between the capsule and the subscapularis. Try to preserve as much uh, as um, as much tendon as possible. And then I use these 90 degrees uh, curved gel pay retractor. This will expose the anterior glenoid, and you see that when you do the posterior level push, you will see exactly where is your joint line. So then I use a knife, and from inferior to superior, I open, I do a vertical um, um, capsulotomy of 1.5 centimeters. This will allow me to introduce the, the tria retractor, and I do an horizontal cut in the labrum, put two sutures on the labrum, 
and then push the labrum inferiorly protected, protected by an almond. Medially, I'm going to use this um, glenoid retractor. And then you see, we are pushing now quite hard on the tria. This exposed nicely the anterior the glenoid. I can do a decortication. And we play then pushing quite hard on the uh, link retractor or glenoid retractor to have a perfect direction of the wire. I drill uh, and put always an inferior 20, uh, 28 millimeters inferior screw. And then for the superior one, I measure. I reattach the labrum between the glenoid and the, the coracoid process with either suture or anchor. And then I use the stump of the coracoid process to reattach the capsule. So I will remove the trial retra retractor, pass suture around the CA ligament, and then pass the suture through the, the capsule. I usually take a bite of five millimeters of capsule. And then this is what I, uh, I explained to you later on. If you just tie the capsule like this, uh, with the arm in external rotation, the, the human head is anteriorly dislocated. So you see that my assistant is doing a posterior level push. The arm is in elevation, external rotation. And at this moment only, I tight my anterior capsule. And at the end, I just close the lateral border of the subcap. Uh, uh, the skin incision is usually 4.5 millimeters, so four or five uh, centimeters. So this is the surgical technique that you can find uh, on the website uh, BMED. And this should be your aim, really parallel screws. Uh, the screws, don't forget that they, they are going from an inferior direction to a superior direction. Postoperatively, no more immobilization. Uh, this is a study that we just finished. It was a prospective, comparative, and randomized study um, that will be presented during the next SEC Congress. All my patient has preoperatively CT scan, um, and we divided uh, the patient, the more than 80 patients, in two groups. One group had a sling for two weeks, and one group absolutely nothing. And postoperatively, at, at the end of the follow-up, there was no difference in the two group and the healing rate was exactly the same. Uh, but the, the patient in the group without sling felt clearly better. They can redo uh, more easily. From, they can redo their daily life more easily. So the, or today, I do not recommend any postoperative immobilization after a latarge. So this is a typical patient day one after the surgery. When I um, when I come in his room to say goodbye, I operated him uh, on the right side, and as you can see, he has already almost a perfect anterior forward flexion right after the surgery. So they are free to move um, passively or even actively, like in this case after the surgery. But they cannot do uh, everything, and what I tolerate for this patient is passive or active mobilization. They can carry maybe one liter, two liters, not more. Uh, if they want to do sport, they walk and they do home trainer and that's it. I don't want them to do sports with the two, uh, the, the, the two arms. And I'm just showing you these pictures because I remember perfectly this patient. I saw him, I was still working at the university hospital. I saw him uh, in the morning, 15 days after the surgery, we removed the staples and the x-ray has been done at 11.35. And the patient did not listen to me and he went, he, he, he ran. So he went for jogging and he came back because he felt something bad in his shoulder. And this is the x-ray at 5 p.m. the same day. And don't forget that when you run, you contract your biceps and you can create a, a pull out of the graft. And this is what happened in this patient. So let them move freely, but really you need to tell them that there are some limits and this is something that they cannot do. So no other sports for six weeks. At six weeks, I allow them to do everything except overhead sports, like volleyball, handball, basketball. I don't, let, I, um, I don't want them to do a contact sport like rugby or soccer. And I don't want them to do crazy sport like base jump. 
these parts, they can redo them after three months. So from zero to six weeks, no sport expect, except walking um, and home trainer. From six weeks to three months, all the sports progressively except the three categories of sport that I just mentioned. And after three months, absolutely everything. And this is the big difference between the latage and all the other procedure because with the other procedure, patients are back to the field not before 4.5 months or even six months. And this is for me a huge difference because it, it can just ruin the, um, the, the season of an athlete. Today, we operate um, two lactagers, and one of them was a hockey player uh, from Canada. I did the first side three weeks ago, the second side today, and this athlete will train in six weeks. So he will, he will be already uh, on the ice in, uh, in six weeks. So this is quite remarkable. So the Latage has um, a very low recurrence rate. This is something that we published in 2013. Uh, I think that in the literature, the recurrence rate is between two to 15%. Uh, there was around 3.4% of persistent apprehension. Um, this is a fascinating topic, but I think it's, it's a, a subject in itself. The, uh, they are really good long-term results. The amazing thing with the Latage is if the, the shoulder is stable at one year, usually it's stable forever. And this is clearly not the case of all the techniques that have still 30% of re recurrences after five years. The return to sport activity is possible in around 80% of the cases at the same level. So this is uh, reasonable. And it has been clearly shown that this is the best pruning procedure. Uh, this is an autograph. It's vascularized. You don't need to do additional incision on the iliac crest and so on. Um, and I think that the biggest advantage is that this surgery is maybe non-anatomic, but I'm not really sure that we need anatomy, an anatomy that failed previously. And this has been a big problem in my practice when I was doing bone count. The, uh, the patient were coming to me and said, okay, I had a shoulder dislocation, sir. And I was saying, okay, I will redo the same, something that you had before. And the patient were looking at me and saying, okay, but this is something that just failed. So do you re really want to do the same, something that failed before? And this is interesting because Latage bring a more stable shoulder. This is more stable than nature. And this is why I love this, uh, this technique. Uh, complication rate, uh, honestly, what has been published before is on, th this was the learning curve of some, of some surgeon because there was clearly not in, in all practice, 25% um, 20, of short-term complication. The, it does not simply exist in all practice. There are, however, long-term complication like dislocation arthropathy, knowing, and I will explain to you later that this is not due to the surgery, this is another disease. So neurological injury, this exists postoperatively. Um, we said length of the screw, orientation of the screw, and try to avoid to go uh, too inferior. So I, I, this is one of the reasons I don't, I, I completely stop to do arthroscopic latage because all the surgeons that are doing arthroscopic latage, all of them had at some point problem. And if it's with the axillary nerve in a 20 years old patient, this is a drama. So I completely stopped to do this. Um, graft non-union, um, as I told you, this is the main goal of this procedure. So again, keep your screw parallel. Uh, ask your patient to smoke. If I have heavy smoker, I just ask my patient to, uh, to use you know, electronic cigarettes because at least you don't have uh, the CO plus the nicotine. It just reduces uh, the risk no anti-inflammatory medication after the, the surgery. And as I told you, I vote to do some sport. And regarding the dislocation arthropathy, this is not, if the surgery is well done, this is not a iatrogenic arthropathy, very important concept. This is just 
uh, arthritis that is the result of lesions that occur during the first dislocation, or maybe that are related to persistent micro-instability. I did a study in 2016, and it, it was quite a good cool study published in um, medicine. We, we took patients that had a unilateral traumatic instability, and we measure precisely the anteroposterior transition of the human head regarding the glenoid on both sides. And we found that there was a clear difference with the normal side and the pathological side. And I operated all these patients on this court and redo a measurement one year later. All the patients, all of them were doing perfectly well and we re redo their activity. And what we found is even if the, the, the human head was moving too much before the surgery, it was moving too much compared to the other side after the surgery. Meaning that the, what we are able to do is to correct macro instability, but not the micro instability. And maybe that this persistent mobility is a cause of uh, long-term uh, arthritis. But of course, and you see it on this uh, CT scan, if you, the position of the graph is not good, you will have arthritis. So dislocation arthropathy in all series, 36% uh, at 10 years, it's mainly Samilton one uh, arthritis that is in most of the case very well tolerated. So what are the take message, take home message? Uh, honestly, I try everything. So I try the, the bank art, I try the hydroscopic latage, and I stop to do this. I try the remplissage, as you know, um, and I already talked about it in a previous um, webinar with you. I, we develop a technique called DAS. It's the transfer of the long kind of the biceps. However, the latage remain in my hand the best surgery, the best French surgery of the world, like I, I love to say. And this, this is 90% of my stabilization still today. This is not an easy surgery. You need to follow all the steps and there are many, many steps. Uh, we, you are very welcome if you want to see how, how I do this surgery. And if you decide to do it with the scope, do a lot of open latage before. I think this is one of the key take home message. We know that arthroscopic latage is feasible, but this is even more dis uh, difficult than the arthroscopic latage. Not, uh, I'm not a giant like Pascal Boileau or Laurent, or Laurent Lafosse. And honestly, you need to be very confident in an in a open way before trying keyhole surgery. Uh, I always use 4.5 cannulated screws. If you use smaller screws, 3.5, 3.75, the screw will bend. This is bad screw. So use good screw like Gilles Valch taught me. And uh, the, the inferior length of the inferior, of the inferior, no, the length of the inferior screw in my hand is always 28 millimeters. There is an article in the GSCS that show that this is the best length. Uh, and then this surgery has a very, easy rehabilitation and a fast return to sport. I think I'm done and I would like to thank you for your attention and of course I will answer all your questions. Thank you Dr. Lederman for yet another fabulous presentation. Uh, Dr. Lederman you can stop sharing actually. I stop to share. Yeah a uh, couple of questions from our side. Now, Dr. Lederman, you have presented on dynamic anterior stabilization before with us, right? So where do you place dynamic anterior stabilization and lethargy? So what are your indications for DAS and what are your indications for your lethargy? Uh, this is a very, very interesting question. I, I didn't talk about my indication for, for lethargy. Um, I don't like to do lethargy in young lady, in young hyperlax lady. Honestly, this is not my best result. I don't like to do latage in unstable, painful shoulder. Um, we don't know if the latage is 
the answer for a patient that don't have bone loss. We will probably have the answer during the next uh, Congress of the French Arthroscopic Society in Toulouse because they did a huge study about it. So Latage for patients that don't have bone loss. So in my hand, I do dynamic anterior stabilization, meaning stabilize, it's exactly like, like the Latage, but you don't use the short head of the bicep, but you use the long head of the biceps. In patients that don't have consequent bone loss, meaning less than 20%, that are hyperlax, that have slap lesion or unstable painful shoulder. For all other type of instability, I prefer the latarge. Thank you, Dr. Lederman. And what about allograft? Do you have experience with allograft? I remember you, I mean, showing a demonstration in our last presentation on allografts when you do an arthroplasty. What about the instability? Yes, so I don't have experience because I don't see why I should not use uh, an autograft, a free vascularized autograft um, that is on site. I mean, you don't need to go somewhere else. You just, it's here. It's here. And I just would like to remind you that the latarge is the only surgery in the, in the field of shoulder surgery. It's the only surgery that never failed during the last 70 years. And this is unique. And I think that there is a reason. And the reason is this is a good surgery. <laughs> and I don't see why I should do complicated, complicated things if there is something that is working since 70 years. So it has stood the test of time, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, uh, Alex, uh, we are also joined by Dr. Loy Al Khatib, who is a shoulder surgeon in uh, Dubai. He's in Sulaiman Al Habib Hospital. Uh, Loy, any questions to Dr. Lederman, please? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Lederman, for the brilliant lecture. Very interesting topic, actually. Um, one of the questions that maybe you can answer, oh, there's no answer for this question until yet. So I didn't find any answer. The limit of the lethargy. What's the percentage of bone loss that you find there will be an aglinoid and you say, okay, there's no place for the lethargy. So we know that. Hello. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is a, a very interesting question. And so, so I'm thinking in my about whole that, life, yeah. uh, yes, in my whole life, I, I did only in one case, it's a patient that, that had recurrent epilepsy and after 10 years, the, she didn't have yet arthritis and she, she was unstable and she had a huge anterior bone loss. And this is the only, uh, I, did one, I did it once. I took an inner crest and add the mm -hmm. coracoid process on top of this. Yeah. But yes, I, I agree with you. We don't know exactly what are the limits. Um, I always try to do a latarge and then if the latarge fails, then I will take a huge piece of uh, iliac crest. Uh, so you'll augment it with iliac crest first. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So I will go to classics. Traditional latarge versus congruent R. I'm sure that you are doing the traditional European one. Any thoughts on right. the congruent R? Um, I think that there, there are nice studies that prove that there is no really advantage. So there is a theoretical advantage for the congruent art, but all the biomechanical study prove that um, there is no really other advantages. You decrease the contact surface. And again, we, we do something in, in some way uh, since 70 years. It's very efficient and I'm not going to change something that is so efficient. That's uh, the new question now. The new trend is replacing the screws with the endo button. I know they are against the endo button. I I heard you before. Are you considering using the endo button now, or are you still using it against them? Given that um, the follow is shifting now to start using the endo button, or he's using he stopped using the screws. Okay, uh, so this, this is an excellent question, actually. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not going to move to on the button for two reasons. The first one is 
I think the people that use the under button are saying that the uh, the screw after an open attaché are bothering the patient. Okay, since 2007, I did my fellowship with Gilles Valch in 2007. Since 2007, I removed three screws. So I reoperate three patients for screw removal. That's it. Um, and this is interesting because in France, some of my friends remove screws in five to 10% of the patient. And I'm just wondering if, because I mean, I'm, I'm walking quite close to the border, so we prob probably operate the same kind of patient. I'm just wondering if it's a question of screw design that they use, maybe if the screws are too long. Um, but I honestly, the, my patient do not have problem with the screws. I do, we, we had a very nice, actually a very interesting Congress um, during the last Swiss orthopedic Congress. And there was a brilliant presentation by the group of Balgrist. They review pa uh, patients many years after the surgery. I think that the mean follow-up was uh, 8.6 years, something Thank like you. this. And they redo MRI to all these patients. And they also do, they also did uh, functional testing. So isocinematic iso testing to all these patients. Interestingly, there was no atrophy of the subcap in this patient compared to the other side. There is no more fat infiltration of the subscap compared to the other side. And the difference in strength in internal rotation is statistically significant. It's around five to seven percent. But in the isokinematic field, you consider that this is clinically significant above 20 percent. So the take home message is for this patient that has been operated with screw in the long term, there is zero difference. Zero difference. So why shall I use something that is complicated that don't provide, according to me, uh, the same stability? Because um, the, the, the the surgeon that use um, the these tension band stuff, they, they, they immobilize they they immobilize their patient postoperatively. Okay, because you don't have a perfect stability. Even if there is a good tension, I'm pretty sure that the the the, uh, the tension is great in the, um, in the long term, or in the mid term, and they have clearly more uh, non-union than I have. Uh, they reported more than 20% of non-union, or what they call fibrous union. <laughs> Remodeling. That, yeah, that is a pseudarthrosis actually, and this is not my um, this is not my case. Got you. Okay. Uh, maybe one, one something to add about arthroscopic lethargy. One of the, I did my fellowship in Canada, shoulder, upper limb reconstruction. So one of the advices they advised us there, if you want to do a lethargy, arthroscopic, just go step, you don't need to go from A to Z doing arthroscopic. The first case, just one step arthroscopic, then open. I agree, you need to be super comfortable doing an open mm -hmm. lethargy then to, to, and then share shift to do it uh, arthroscopically. Um, so you are going more medial than the traditional deltopectoral uh, approach. Just go medial to, this is a good trick, go more medial to the coracoid and uh, do the approach there. Yeah, the, the, this is why they developed this suicide portal, it, because you, they don't have, with the scope, they don't have retractor to rotate the scapula. So you really need to be medial if you yeah. want to have screw that are, it, that are quite parallel. Nice. And I'm interested in your research that you just presented. And what was the rate of return to sport to competitive level? Um, some weeks ago, we published a study in arthroscopy and we compare bone cards to, um, to Latarge. 
And interestingly, our rate of return to sport to competitive level is exactly the same that the one we published in 2013. It was around uh, 83%. Five, 83%. So around 80%. Mm -hmm. And my, well, my, my friend, Johan Bard, that is operated only, you know, very high level uh, professional skier or rugby player had a little bit lower score. And I have a more reasonable, um, I have more reasonable patients. So I have slightly higher scores. Um, but this is around 80%. And interestingly, with the bar card, the rate was slightly higher. But again, the, the, the return to sport is not before six months. And interestingly, the bank card had a loss in, of, uh, External of yeah, at 90 degrees of abduction. That is quite important for overhead players. Uh, so the return to sport is not unbelievable. I think that there are many, many reasons. First of all, um, life can change. <clears throat> A patient can have different expectations. We never talk about persistent uh, apprehension, but I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that even if we do, we have few micro instability, the rate of micro instability is clearly higher. And this is something that we are evaluating. Uh, so there are many, many, many reasons why it's not 100%. That's true. And maybe another thing, just last thing to add, maybe the micro instability due to the disruption of the neuroreceptors receptors that, that are found in labrum, the proprioceptors that uh, you normally found it in labrum, that might lead to the micro instability that you're talking about. Yeah, I agree. So we, we, we did an unbelievable series of, of study about brain remodeling after shoulder instability. Uh, and what is interesting is after a simple shoulder dislocation, you have a complete brain remodeling. So we demonstrated this in 2014. Then I operate this patient um, and we redo uh, a functional MRI one year later. And we observed some brain healing, but actually it was not perfect. Okay. And if it was not perfect, there are maybe two reasons. First of all, maybe we need more time. Mm -hmm. Or the other reason could be that there is this persistent micro instability mm -hmm. that actually plays a role on peripheral nerves as well. So now all these patients that I operated 10 years ago are redoing functional MRI 10 years later to see if finally they healed. Nice. And I don't have the results yet. It would be cool if we can find the mechanoreceptors before and after the injury and their redistribution where they would be found, the mechanoreceptors in the shoulder and the shoulder. That would be, if you can track them, that would be cool and see how. This would how be amazing. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. I think that's all the questions you have, right? Exactly. Okay, Dr. Ladman, thank you for yet another brilliant presentation. And that's all the questions that we have for this session. And really look forward for one later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you, Lloyd. Take care. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye.